I'm Graham Taylor and you're watching Potted History. If you've been to one of my prehistoric pottery workshops or you've attended one of the events like at Brinkethley D or up around Kilmartin or one of the many others that have done around the country, you might have gone home thinking, oh, how can I make one of those pots myself? Well, you can and you can get the materials fairly easily. You can get clay from most craft shops and art shops and things like that, and you can even dig it in your own garden. But if you do buy it, what you're probably going to get is something nice and smooth and even, and it doesn't have much tooth to it, doesn't have much grit to it. But what you need for making prehistoric pottery, especially if you're going to fire it in an open fire, is you need really quite gritty pottery or clay. Don't buy the sort of clay where they tell you it's air drying or these sort of um, plasticized modeling clays like DAS. What you want is natural clay. So go to a proper craft shop, get proper potter's clay. What I'm going to show you how to do is how to ruin this, this perfectly nice smooth clay. Now I'm going to show you how to make it so that it will work in an open firing. And then in the next video I'll show you how to fire the pots yourselves. Now what I've got on the table here are some um, crushed down old pots, what we call grog. Grog is just old pots that have been crushed back down again. Not the sort that you get in your kitchen but the sort of pots that have been made in a traditional Neolithic Bronze Age way. We've got sand here as well, really useful addition to the clay. We've got some gravel, quite gritty stuff. This happens to be stuff from a local quarry. And what I've got here is some wood shavings. Some finer of the type you might get for your pet from the pet store. So this is this is loose shaving, wood shavings. If you're using something like hamster shavings, it's a good idea to put them through a garden sieve if you can. Um, something just to give you a finer material. This is really a little bit on the coarse side. Um, yeah, you can use it, but it might leave a, quite a lot of cavities in your pot where, when, after it's fired. Um, this will leave also leave cavities, but they'll be tolerable. Um, and you can, of course, also use fine sawdust if you've got it. So wh whatever material comes to hand, something nice and fine, and you can give it a rub through if you want to. These are all materials which I add into clay, and I'll explain why. When you fire pots in your open fire, moisture has to escape nice and easily out of that clay as it heats up without blowing the pot apart. The coarse clay allows gaps and little niches through which that moisture can escape. And the organic material that's often in natural clays and is removed from the commercial clays that you get, that burns out at quite low temperatures and does the same thing. It allows you to get that moisture out of the clay. And that's the reason the sawdust's there. So let's have a quick look at what we're going to do with this. Um, usually these powders are quite dusty, so I tend to add a bit of moisture to them when I'm adding them to my clay. And I'm taking some of the grog here, some of the crushed down old pots. Now, don't, as I say, don't crush down the things that come out of your kitchen. But if you've done some experiments in the past and you've fired them and they haven't worked very well or they've broken or whatever, it's a good material to add into your clay. So what I'm doing to that is I'm wetting it down a little bit. And now I'm going to start to knead this into my clay. And to knead it, I normally would stand up. So let's get into action with it. So kneading, folding the clay over with the material underneath it will help it to work into the clay. So I'm using the grog first. I'm actually going to add in all of these ingredients. So we'll start with some grog. We'll add a little sand. So I'm going to take some of that sand. Again, I'm going to wet it down a bit first. Apart from anything, the material itself dries the clay out, so we want to keep the clay moist to work with. So this dry material, I don't want it to dry. 
dry this clay out too much. There we go. Get some sand in there. I'm going to get a bit of this really coarse grit. Now this is going to make the clay really gritty. There we go. Some of that. And this I might have to really work that in. There we go. Pick up a bit more of all of that. This is quite a small little piece of clay, but that's ideal if you're making small pots for your experiments. Add a bit more of that in, and a bit more of that in, and a bit more of that in. There we go. As you can see, this is a lot of material going into this. Don't add just a bit. Get it really gritty. There we go. And then last of all, I'm going to take some of this sawdust, or shavings. If you've got a hamster at home, this is probably the sort of thing that would have gone in there. Now, people in prehistoric times and Anglo-Saxon times in Britain would often add organic material to their clay in the form of animal dung. I'm not suggesting you do that. And this is the sort of substitute for that, is this sawdust. There we go. Add all these things in. And it acts as that, what we call an opening material. It opens up the clay, allowing moisture and things to escape. Of course, what you end up with is a relatively fragile pot. But that is how pots were in the Neolithic and the Bronze Age, often quite fragile. So, we've been mixing that in for a minute or two now. Let's have a look what we've got. Because it started off looking nice and smooth, and now it looks like that. So now we've got our really nice, very gritty piece of clay. Lots and lots and lots and lots of grit in there. And that is going to become our little Neolithic bowl. That's what I'm going to make, is a little Neolithic bowl. You can make whatever you feel like making. So I'm knocking that together. And the first thing I do is I turn it into a nice round ball of clay. There we go, a nice round ball of clay. And then to form the pot, to form a small pot, start off with my thumb at the top, I put a little dent, I turn the clay around a little bit, I make that dent a bit deeper, and a bit deeper, and a bit deeper, and a bit deeper, and I work down into the clay, pushing my thumb in there until I'm about that far away from the other side, and I've got a ball of clay that I can hold up on my thumb, like that. Now, that's going to help because I can now wrap my fingers around there with my thumb inside, and I can give a little squeeze and a little turn and a little squeeze and a little turn and a little squeeze and a little turn. And as I work round and round and round like that, using my thumb on the inside, which makes a nice shape for the inside of the bowl, and my fingers on the outside, which make a perfect mould for the outside of the bowl, I can form a nice, even, Neolithic bowl. The key is small movements. If you do it in great big movements, you're going to get quite a rough pot. But if you can do it bit by bit by bit by bit by bit, working round, a small movement each time and a small squeeze each time, you will end up with quite a decent little bowl. And if I really want to make it look properly Neolithic, I'm going to give it what's called a carination, so I'm going to change the way the curve goes. And to do that, all I do is I put my fingers on the inside this time, and my thumb just below the rim, and I'm going to give a little squeeze and a little turn, a little squeeze and a little turn. I'm going to work round it in that direction now. Now you can see that the rim of this pot is cracking up a bit. Don't worry about that. We can sort that out in a minute, and we will. What we're going to do is just work round and round and round a little bit, and give that a change of direction that way. Now, to a large extent, 
the thinner you make the pot, the better it will fire. But if you make it too thin, it'll break and crack before you get it in the fire. So you're looking for something that is around about sort of five to ten millimetres thick, uh, around about a quarter of an inch thick. That's the sort of thickness you want it to be. And once you've got that, you've got a pot which stands a fairly good chance of getting through the firing. So there we go. It's a chunky and fairly ro ragged looking little bowl, but at the moment it's holding together quite nicely. So what I'm going to do is just do a little bit more refining. I'm going to just work around that and I'm just using my thumb to actually squeeze round the edges there and then I can work into there with my finger turn this into a nice little bowl all the way around and back down into the bottom of the bowl again fingers on the outside thumb on the inside and I'm pinching that out I'm trying to make it that as I say that sort of five to ten millimeter thickness the nearer five millimetres it is, probably the better it's going to be, the easier it's going to fire. And once I get to that sort of stage, if I wet it a little bit, you don't need to use a spray, you can just use something else, you should be able to smooth out the surface and get rid of quite a lot of those little cracky bits on the surface there. Just with a little bit of water, we'll work over it and we'll get rid of the cracks and dents and things like that. And again, right around there. And I'm going to work around the rim as well. Tidy that up. So do a fair bit of tidying. Get the pot as good looking as you possibly can before you start to decorate it. And for decorating, well, you can draw into the surface. People in the past often used to just take a point. This one's a bone point. It could be a wooden point. It could be the end of a pencil. And you can simply draw patterns into the surface. That's often the case that people would draw onto the surface of the pot, just not pressing too hard, just scratching into the surface there. Or you might choose, and a lot of prehistoric people did, to use twisted cords, so basically string. We make our own string, usually from things like lime bark bast or flax or nettles. All of these things make good cordage and you can press patterns into the surface using that. I'm going to finish this pot off and then I'm going to set it to dry. Now, before you can fire it, it needs to be very, very dry. So I'm going to set it aside and I'm probably going to leave it for a couple of weeks before I get round to actually firing it. So put it on a nice warm windowsill, leave it there, let it completely dry out. There's no rush. I've known people wait for a couple of years before they've fired some of their pots. Um, and I'll show you how to fire it in the next video. Follow the link to the next video to learn how to fire the pots that you've made. And subscribe to our channel for lots of fascinating videos on ancient pottery making techniques.